And welcome to coverage of Pro Tour Gate Crash here from Montreal. My name is Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm in the booth with Brian David Marshall, and we are in round two of the second draft. It's round 10 of the tournament. Jerry Thompson versus Robert Yurkovich. Get a look at Jerry there as he plays a mountain. Robert's going to lead off with an island. So uh, looking at these two players' deck lists. See a uh, disciple of the old ways for... Yeah, you Robert. know, Robert, you're playing an archetype we saw last round, actually. Yep. You're uh, being he, generous. He, he's, well... <laughs> archetype. Yeah. He's playing Simic, which is splashing red. Okay. Uh, on the other side of the table, Jerry Thompson playing a very, very aggressive uh, Boros deck. Yeah, it looks really, really aggressive. He's got well, a, a couple skin cards brand I'm excited goblin. to see. Yeah, he's got a skin brand goblin to lead things off on his side. Eh, not the most aggressive possible start, but we see Robert is going to use a Prophetic Prism to draw a card here, potentially fix his mana after he attacked with his Disciple. He you does have a follow-up play, the Wasteland Viper. So let, let's take a look at uh, what's going on in the hand of Robert Jerkovic. We see a Wasteland Viper, a Nimbus Swimmer, a Scab Clan Charger, a Prophetic Prism, which he just played into the Wasteland Viper. So a Nimb Nimbus Swimmer, Millennial Gargoyle, Scab Clan Charger. That's what's uh, remaining in his hand. Yep. What's Jerry going on on the other side of the table? This is uh, kind of exciting. Some exciting cards here. Foundry Street Denizen, Boros Reckoner. Which he does not decide to play yeah. on turn three after he, he did trade off his skin brand Goblin with the uh, with the Viper. Warmind uh, Infantry hits the table, and then we have Cinder Elemental, Odrin Veteran, and a Mountain. Pretty sure you just said Cinderella, by the way. I did. I did. Yeah. Uh, so is that a Simic Manipulator that there? That is a Simic Manipulator that uh, he just drew. All this right, so that's a type of card that has the capability of taking over a game if it gets out of hand. Yeah, if it's not playing against a red deck. That's right. So Jerry's going to have to make it a priority to get rid of that card. He is going to attack with his 2-3. Yep. He's going to get in, and he's going to play Cinder Elemental probably for that reason. He, he can't let that Simic Manipulator even get up to two counters. It'll steal his uh, Warmind Infantry, and once it does, he never gets it back. It's, yeah. it's not one of these, oh, until it's alive, or it's just gone. Yeah, yeah, All right, so Disciple of the Old Ways is going to hit the red zone and get in for two for Robert Yurkovich as he plays his fourth land and decides what he wants to do. He's got a Millennial Gargoyle, a card we saw earlier in this Simic Splash Red. Not a particularly strong card, but you could do worse, right. and it looks like he's going to play the uh, Scab Clan Charger. Yep. Scam Clan Charger. It is going to evolve the Simic Manipulator. It does have one counter right now. Can't steal anything as both of Jerry's creatures both have two power. And let's look at that Cinder Elemental and be pretty sure that that's, you know, that just has to get down to the business of killing that Simic Manipulator. It absolutely does. Now, it does require a tap to activate, so he won't be able to attack and kill the Manipulator, at least not with the Cinder Elemental. So let's see what he wants to do here. Looks like he's going to take care of business right now. He has Robert tapped out, yep. and he has no fear of just killing it. He also has a nice little follow-up play. Something, something he would have liked to see on turn one. He actually is playing multiples of Foundry Street Denizen. This is a very, very aggressive Boris stack. It yeah. hasn't played out that way. But uh, he's mounting it, right? I mean, he's got, look at that, he's got the two creatures and start to try to get a little uh, battalion going thanks to that, I with mean, that Warmind. Yeah, and he's got a couple cards know. that'll help with that in his hand again. We yep. see the Reckoner and the Odin Veteran. And uh, Robert's not really able to do much here. He plays a second Prophetic Prism in a land, but just passes a turn back. Did, didn't want to get a Nimbus Swimmer into play as a... As, as a 1-1. One, one. Well, no, I meant oh, just tap instead out of the it. Prism. Yeah. And he didn't have enough mana to, to cast his Manor Gargoyle. He does have a Shamble Shark. Though, Millenni so Millennial he's... Gargoyle. Uh, is he, what did I say? Manor Gargoyle. Oh, yeah, that's that a much, much better much card. Better card. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the, uh, all right, so Boros Reckoner now comes down for, for Jerry T. And uh, in response, it looks like, Oh, it was okay. So Jerry just passed the turn back, and uh, Robert said, "All right, well, I'm going to play my Shamble Shark on end step here," and he does just that. So now he's got Shamble Shark added to his uh, added to the ranks here, and he's got an island. Plus, he still has that Nimbus Swimmer and the Millennial Gargoyle. Yeah, but that that Boros Reckoner is gonna do a little reckon. <laughs> yeah, just uh, holds down this board. It certainly can. He's gonna. Uh, looks like Robert says, you know, I want to have the biggest possible Nimbus Swimmer that I can make. So he's going to start with a Millennial Gargoyle, which is going to evolve Shamble Shark, make it into a 3-2. Um, wait, wait, what? How did Paul Ritzel already 
<laughs> Paul Reitzel won a game. Wait a minute, I've seen I've seen matches be this far in where people haven't resolved mulligans. Yeah. <laughs> Paul Reitzel's up a game on Shahar Shenhar. That was really really fast. Although we shouldn't be surprised. Paul is a skilled magician. Uh, five alarm fire in the hand of Jerry Thompson. That is not a card. I've have you have you played with that card? Yeah, I have. Yeah, how 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 is it? I haven't ha I haven't had a chance to play with it yet. It's it's strong. I mean, you you want to get that first activation. That that's the goal. The second one is gravy. Remember, you don't have to sacrifice it. It just it, you can just keep removing counters. But the way that I found it most useful is it, as is kind of like a lava axe where you play it, you attack with a bunch of creatures where you don't care if some of them die because you're going to get in for four with the two that don't get blocked, and then you'll get the last five damage off of your uh, five alarm fire. That's that's how I've got the most use out of it. But it looks like Jerry's going to be able to kind of tick it up slowly thanks to Boros Reckoner being a nightmare to do combat with. And an Ordrune veteran is going to be the last card out of Jerry's hand. He's got a significant board state here, and he actually is set up to get that five alarm fire active if he wants to. He can do it in a pretty interesting way because the veteran and the Reckoner can both have, well, double and first strike, but they can both do damage before Robert's cards, and he can get a couple of counters there uh, to set up potentially killing a different blocker so one of his guys doesn't die. We'll see what Jerry comes up with on his turn, but right now it's on Robert. That seems like a 4-4 uh, four, four Nimbus Swimmer. Yeah, he's he's drawn a Guild Gate, <clears throat> so he won't be able to, there, to add that. He's going to wait another turn. He might. He seems very patient. <laughs> but it feels like uh, you'd want to, like, he could draw another spell next turn that he might want to play, and you don't want to you don't want to get that far behind in your uh, board development. So let's see what he decides. He moves those two prophetic prisms to the side. He can cast pretty much anything, uh, but he's only got two cards in hand and only one spell. Does making it a 5-5 five, five change anything? Probably not a lot. All right, he, it looks like he is going to say, yep, we're going to make a 4-4. Four, four. He's going to get an Evolve on the Shamble Shark here as well, so it's not. It's a, it's a pretty nice, pretty nice play for him. And it looks like he's ready to mount an offensive here as he probably realizes that he's not going to be able to race that well. He sends in with the Shamble Shark and the Millennial Gargoyle. Yeah, and that 4-4 and that four, four Nimbus sw Swimmer is problematic for Jerry getting back across the table. He needs, uh, it's he needs, huge. He needs a way to push through that. You know, yeah. Boris Reckoner just trades with that. That's right. And Jerry says, yep, sure, I'll take it all. So he takes six damage here on this attack. And we know Robert's got a gate. He's decided if he... 13? Oh, oh, is it actually a stomping that ground? That was actually a stomping oh, ground. Oh, it's actually a stomping ground. That can't ground. be a stomping ground. Did he just pay two life for it? Oh, yeah, I guess he did because he wants to keep his... He wants to be able to activate his... Uh, his uh, disciple, disciple of the old ways. ways. Okay, instead of having... this, So that's what he was deciding which makes the decision a lot more, makes a lot more sense if he had the opportunity to make a 5-5 a five, five Nimbus Swimmer. Does that make a difference, right, to the clock, to the blocks, all that kind of stuff? He decided it didn't. If he, it, leaving up the mana for Disciple of the Old Ways with First Strike means he can block the Order and Veteran and just trade off, even if, even if uh, Battalion triggers, which it is going to trigger here. So the Order and Veteran is going to become a 3-1 with Double Strike, and the Warmind Infantry is going to become a 4-3. The Boros Reckoner becomes the awesome thing that it was when he cast it, a Boros Reckoner. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we get a look at what that one card is in Jerry's hand. And we see what? that it is actually <laughs> another Boros <laughs> Reckoner. <laughs> Boros. Did, did Jerry accidentally bring a constructed deck here? What's better than Boros Reckoner in draft? Yeah. Two Boros <laughs> The Reckoners. other one. <laughs> so right now, Jerry is in a position where he's going to get three counters on that five alarm fire no matter what, basically. I mean, Robert has no cards in hand. So damage, or combat damage is going to happen here. 
and that's going to put him one counter away from being able to be to just pop that thing off for five to kill a tough blocker or to just go and kill Robert if, if enough damage gets through based on what we're seeing here. Robert's setting up his blocks. And he, he does, in fact, put the Disciple in front of the Ordering uh, Veteran and give it first strike. Yeah, it's very interesting on the Five of the Furries. It just doesn't matter if it hits your player. It's just... No. Whenever, it's just whenever the, your whenever, guys are fighting? Yeah. yeah if it tussles... Burning. Yeah. That you, you get to put a counter on the five alarm fire. That's right. And so it, it looks like Robert wants to trade off the sure, Nimbus Swimmer, sure. like you mentioned, for the Boros Reckoner. Take four from the Warmind Infantry. So first strike happens first. Normal damage. And he says normal damage. Okay. And there's a few triggers that are going to go on. It's going to bring the five alarm fire trigger. up to four. And he's deciding where he wants to put his Boros Reckoner trigger. Now, Boros Reckoner just took damage. In fact, it took four. And he can direct it where he wants. Robert's going to drop to nine from regular damage uh, from the Warmind Infantry. So if he does it to Robert's face, then all he needs to do is just get one you. counter on that five alarm fire and the game's over. So I wouldn't be surprised if he just dropped Robert down here. As long as Jerry did. can survive. And it turns out the second Boros Reckoner is going to do a lot to help keep him alive as well. So Robert Yurkovich has to find an answer for either the five alarm fire or a way to kill his opponent, Jerry Thompson, right now. Jerry's only burden is turning guy sideways and not forgetting his trigger on five alarm fire. So uh, he's got an easy path to victory from where he stands right now. <laughs> you, you hear the, <laughs> I, I don't know, <laughs> we could see Robert Yurkovich stare at the screen and kind of crack a smile and shake his head and, like, and Jerry laugh. He's like, exactly the card I need here, Cedro Denizens. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Robert Yurkovich is forced to scoop up his permanence as Jerry Thompson takes down the first game of the match here. Making five alarm fire look good. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes Lava Axe is good. I, again, it can hit creatures too. Is that a, is that a constructed playable card? Potentially. You can play Magic at a store near you every Friday. Earn Planeswalker points and battle against your friends in Friday Night Magic. February's FNM promo card is Reliquary Tower. Visit wizards.com slash FNM to find a store near you. Yeah, I mean, I could see it in like a token deck. Sure. Where you can just use it as your big finish and just bash with everything or, and then get it. Or, or you can just play with Boris Reckoner, I yeah, guess. Yeah, which, which, which is just so hard to deal with in combat. You know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jerry has two copies of Boros Reckoner. <laughs> How do you get that in draft? <laughs> two? Uh, I think you're going to look at the card. I mean, and fitting for this tournament because this has been one of the, the defining cards of this tournament yeah. in, in constructed and, and limited now. Right. Uh, Boros Reckoner, it's a powerful creature that punches damage through even when blocked. That's what we saw. Jerry's like, yeah, it's dead. Take four. Take four. Right? Yeah. Uh, ability gives it first strike, makes blocking decisions difficult. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, you know what else? I can just, I can just really screw around with you. Yeah, and uh, that's a nice way of saying it. Makes decisions difficult for opponent. It's more like they look at it and they're like, how am I supposed to deal with this thing in combat? It just doesn't lose combat right. very often. And then uh, we did a we did a deck tech yesterday with uh, David Sharfman, who was talking about his Boros Reckoner deck that he played in Standard. Yes. And his deck is capable of giving his Boros Reckoner lifelink uh -huh. with Azorius Charm. Yes. And then capable of making it indestructible yes. with Boros Charm. Yes. Uh, and then uh, if it's taking damage from, yes. uh, from a removal spell in combat, you know, all that stuff is in instant mm -hmm. speed. Uh, you're able to set up where your Boros Reckoner is dealt damage, yes. deals that damage back to itself, yes. deals more damage back to itself, more damage back to itself, gaining life each time because yes. of the lifelink, doesn't die because of indestructible, and you're able to gain you know, nigh infinite amounts of life That's right. and make it impossible for your opponent to kill you. That's right. Via damage. Yeah, via damage. Now, or the, almost impossible. The good news is we don't have Azorius Charm. <laughs> here in limited, so that was from Return to Ravnica. But uh, but that's still uh, just as a creature on the table. The card is fantastic. So now it sounds like we have a, another back table result. Uh, Shuhei Nakamura is playing against. Uh, 
Kenny Oberg, and mm -hmm. he is up one game to zero. We know that Paul Reitzel is up one game to zero against Shahar Shenhar. In the blink of an eye. In the blink of an eye, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh, and we have a match between Eric Froelich and Ben Stark going on at one of the other tables. And that match is going into its third game. Oh, that's that's fantastic. Hopefully their decks aren't too fast. We'll ben, ben Stark, who's, who's, who was reaping a lot of uh, the removal benefits, uh, has, has a removal heavy or something. I'm going to mulligan uh, yeah. Downstream from to. Melissa. No, I'm mulliganing. Jerry makes it clear that he's going to be mulliganing his hand. He had no red mana sources. So. And it looks like Robert Yerkovic also mulligan. So both of these players are going to start on six. Yeah, it seems like, you know, Jerry wants to be on the play in a huge way <laughs> every single three, time. Three, fa three Foundry Street Denizen? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah. Um, three Ember Beast as well. I wonder if Robert has anything in the board. I, you know, when you take the the line that Jerry took of being this aggressive with those Foundry, I mean, three Foundry Street Denizen is very, very aggressive. But those cards are also fairly easy to deal with, and uh, you'll often board into some kind of, some cards that you might not normally play. Anything that's also a one-one, you know, you, you you know, you might put in your deck if you're in Robert's side. Uh, anything that can get in the way of those type of cards or trade them off early, because he knows he's going to need to be alive. Now, it turns out that Jerry also has double Boros Reckoner, which is th th there's really no way to sideboard for that. You would already have the things to deal well with that are in your main deck, and no, it's just a testament to the deck that, that Jerry's put together to his skill at opening booster packs. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, while uh, these guys were mulliganing, by the way, Shahar Shenhar uh, evened up the match against okay. Paul Rietzel. So they're, they're oh, he one, did. one yeah. right. That one went a little longer. Not, so. not that much, though. <laughs> I mean, a little longer than the first one. <laughs> that must have been a, a situation where he uh, didn't have much. All right, so Jerry's taking a look at his opener here. And Robert as well. We see <laughs> that's a funny opening hand with the uh, with the Ember Beast, but he does have the red mana in hand to, to cast yeah, it potentially. Yeah. So. <laughs> Ember Beast is is an interesting splash for Simic, but it, it, you mentioned it earlier. It does evolve like basically everything. And, and you know, and there and there are a couple of pit fights in Robert Yurkovic's deck. And oh, it's great. Let me tell you something. Fight. Ember Beast may not be much in terms of. Uh, you know, fighting in the out in the open, but mm -hmm. you put him in the pit, oh, and yeah. he is awesome. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so it looks like Robert is keeping his six card land. hand, but Jerry is uh, is going down to five. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry's teasing him about getting getting reckoners in his opening hand. <laughs> <laughs> so here, take a look at the hand that uh, Robert Yurkovic will have to work with here. In the opening, uh, I guess we'll have to wait until the screen. Until we're actually in the match, I suppose. Yeah. But we know that it's uh, he's he's holding a shamble shark, an ember beast, a simic manipulator, a forest, grill guild gate, and stopping ground. Yeah. So it looks like his red splash is actually very easy. He also had double prefer. But his main deck blue blue is coming very hard. So yes. that's you know, simic manipulator is a little while off, and and oh, it looks like uh, Jerry did in fact get to his Boros Reckoner. And he even has the mana to cast it. He's also got a homing lightning, which can help out if uh, if Robert decides that, like, a double block or something to try to just get rid of that Reckoner is the way to go. And uh, is that an Ember Beast for Jerry, I believe? <laughs> look at you. <laughs> there we get a look at uh, Rick's hand. Let's take a look at Jerry's He's got five cards in hand. We're populating it as we speak. And let's see. It looks like we're just going to get the Reckoner down there because that's what you do. Yeah. It's facing down an Ember Beast that can't attack currently. It also can't block. There's an Urban Evolution, I see, for Robert. Like you mentioned, though, the, the blue mana is a bit of an issue. Um, Pit Viper. Or Wasteland Viper. Wasteland Viper. Oh, that's an interesting draw for Jerry. So let's take a look at uh, what Jerry's got there. Aerial Maneuver. Yeah. Add it to the mix. I mean, because Boros Reckoner wasn't hard enough already to deal with in combat, you know, you, you get to give it plus one, plus one, and just... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about that card uh, in, the, in the first game. Oh, yeah. That would 
a pretty sweet top deck, but instead he just yeah. top decked another Boris Reckoner. Yeah. <laughs> that was fine. As it, as it turns out, that was really good. It, it was also okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, land for Jerry. Jerry's starting with five cards here in this game, and uh, Robert Yerkovic starting with six. That's right. All right, so Jerry's just going to attack. He, he does have a potential combat trick uh, from Robert's eyes, and he, in fact, is, is going to uh, just take the damage here. It is only three. I mean, you know, as good as Boros Reckoner is, if, if it's a 3-3 three, three for three that just attacks and hits you every turn, that, that's pretty sweet, but that's not devastating the board yeah. state or anything. I mean, we, we've played with yeah. Centaur it's, Coursers. You, you, know but, it's uh, the, you know the end times are coming when you see a lot of Millennial Gargoyles. <laughs> they are harbingers of, uh, of that's the end what times. That is? Yeah. Maybe that's why I don't play those very <laughs> often. <laughs> they make me feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Syndic of Tides for Jerry in his hand. He followed up with an Ember Bee, so even though he was on a mulligan to five, he's managed to put six power on the table here. And uh, six power that's pretty tough to get in the way of. The Ember Beast, you know, that, that, that aerial maneuver is going to be really good here because if, if Robert tries to trade off his Ember Beast for anything, it's not going to happen. And uh, as well as uh, Jerry's Ember Beast tussling with the Viper, that's not going to work either. So, you know, Robert has some, yeah, a pretty straightforward blocking scenario here. But uh, Jerry's going to come out ahead because of Boros Reckoner. If he wants to use the aerial maneuver to save his Ember Beast, he can do that. He can also use it to save his Boros Reckoner. He kind of decides what he, he has to decide what he wants to do here. If he doesn't save the Reckoner, he can trade it off for the Ember Beast. He does, in fact, use aerial maneuver and says, all right, Beast for Go. your one drop is fine. And he's going to follow up with the Syndic Yeah, and he couldn't tides. play this Syndic of Tithes first to get an extra trigger because he didn't have three white sources. Ah. And then we see Urban Evolution. So a, a card that you and I are both very fond of. We just talked about it in just, our last segment. Just but man, when you're under a lot of pressure. Just doesn't always brutal. doesn't always do everything. Yeah. You know, tap five mana and put some cards in your hand. Yeah, and then say go and, and, and you know potentially take another five damage here. All right. So we have a homing lightning for Jerry that he could use right now if he wanted to try to get an extra uh, two damage extort. plus the extort, but he's going to just extort 13, his 21. denizen here as he just wants look to look at Dirk Frick's hand. Okay, uh, does, and Robert does have double blue now, so he can he can uh, start to get that Simic Manipulator online, although we'll have some lead sickness so we'll be able to use it right away. He's going to start off with a prophetic prism, though. It's what he drew, it's what he drew for the turn. Robert's sitting at 13. He's not... No. It, it's unlikely that he dies next turn, so he does have a little bit of wiggle room to try to set up that manipulator. You can use it to steal the Denizen or maybe even the Syndic of Tides to try to just, you know, put Jerry in an awful situation as far as combat goes. But we do know that Jerry has homing lightning in hand, and uh, if he doesn't want to let that Syndic manipulator live, then he can make that choice. So Jerry's drawn a planes for the turn. He's got Robert to 13. He's got an extort trigger in his pocket here, so Robert's at a virtual 12. Reasonably certain that that homing lightning is going to be pointed at a Simic manipulator. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, the match between Kenny Oberg and Shuhei Nakamura is also tied at 1-1. Uh, and I think we had a, a result on Paul... Paul on. Uh, Froelich and Ben Stark. I did not hear. With ben, ben Stark winning two games to one. Okay. So we have two other matches going into in their third game right now. So Jerry decided on a Boros Reckoner attack, which Robert took to drop him down to 10. And okay. Jerry's thinking, and he just says, you know what, go ahead. Okay. And here comes uh, Shamble Shark. Shamble Shark on end step, and he says, it was right on the stack. He says, I'm going to homing lightning as you predicted yeah all of your simic manipulators yep. that's right and also he's going to pay for the extort which is going to drop robert down to nine here so i see an elusive crisis that deals with boros reckoner quite nicely sure just holds it off 
I will deal no damage back to it. That that's is right. my plan. It's, it's actually interesting that that's he doesn't he might not want to evolve it for a while. <laughs> you know, start start pinging other stuff like him or his shamble shark. Right, and, start to, and be able to get in with the uh, millennial. Is this a big nimbus wow. swimmer? It is indeed one, two, three, four. It's Bigger. a six, six, and it's going to evolve the shamble shark as well. So that's a nice stabilizing play. Does does Robert even have an attack here? Jerry's at twenty two, so he's got to start getting his life total down. But Robert's at nine. He, he doesn't want to really? make a mistake here. The other question is, does he have a block here? And if you're not blocking, mm -hmm. one guard. You know, you got to be attacking, right? Absolutely. Is going to just send the turn back though. He does want to be But he wants to be able up. to block a Syndic. He wants to be able to. Yep. Okay, here's a card that we've been talking about since the draft portion. It's a Court Street Denizen. This is the white version of the Denizen cycle, and it's going to uh, allow Jerry, if he draws other white creatures after this, to tap down creatures on Robert's side. Now, well, it's okay here. You know, he doesn't have another white creature, so he's going to have to draw that, but. Uh, it but, could, but, be, but it it could be a big play later. It certainly changes the implications of every attack step for Robert Yurkovic for the rest of the game. Exactly. He has to now live in fear. Right. He has to leave two guys back. If he thinks Night Watch uh, is, a, is a play, yeah. he has to leave three guys back. Um, yeah, plus, it's a spell that uh, Jerry can extort with and get him, get him to eight here. And then, then you know, Boris Reckoner is not getting any less troublesome. That's right. And, and he can it, still it, just trade it with the... Well, what is he going to do? Block with his 6-6? Six, six? Yeah, yeah, block with the Nimbus Swimmer. And okay. And he's just like, you know, I yeah. think I'll have you take 6, and I'll just, you know, draw another well, spell. Well, I'll get you to 3, you. right? Yeah. Extort. <laughs> All right, so pay for the extort off of the Court Street Dennis, and that's going to drop Robert down to 8. Go. And Jerry it says, go. So, yeah, I, I would have kind of liked to have seen, I think, the, the Millennial Gargoyle maybe sneak in an attack last turn. It wasn't going to block anything. Mm -hmm. All right, well, Robert has decided that that thing's not going to block because, again, he doesn't want to take six off it, so he's going to attack for six in the air, which is a nice hit, but Jerry's it's the first damage that Robert's gotten through. He's going to play an elusive crisis that's going to um, evolve the Shamble Shark to bring it up to a 4-3. And Jerry draws for the turn a Scorchwalker. Oh, uh, that's, a, that's a card. That could be. Um, you know, it might be more valuable as an extort here. Uh, how many creatures does Robert have? One, two, three. And Jerry has four. He could be really brave and just attack with everything here, oh. but that's just asking for it. I mean, what he could also do, you know, just theoretically, is pass the turn, wait for some attack from. Robert Yerkovic, scorch walk his guy, yeah. block him. <laughs> that would be game. Block, block it with the Reckoner and redirect, yeah. Not going to happen, obviously. Yeah, right. I don't think Robert will Robert's be not going to attack into anybody it. into a Reckoner yeah, anytime but, soon. But that is a play that Jerry will have in mind in case the opportunity arises. Yeah, we saw people using Keswick Wolf Run on their opponent's creatures. Oh, really? When they were in combat with Boris Reckoner. Oh, I didn't see that. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. All right, Jerry does actually decide to just move in here. I think Robert only has one card in hand, and Jerry doesn't put him on anything. Oh, well, he only has, one. yeah, he only has three guys, so. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what I was saying. It's very yeah. brave for Jerry to do this because he's opening himself up, but he's going for it. Jerry says, you know what? I'm just going to blood rush this thing, and <laughs> Robert's like, yeah, I don't have anything. So Jerry, Jerry said, you know what? I feel like he doesn't have it. Plus, the Boros Reckoner is going to get some amount of damage in and not die anyway. I'm moving in, and it paid off for him there, as Robert didn't have a way to deal with any of his creatures. And Blood Rush takes down the match for Jerry. My colors, my guild, my shirt. Proclaim your allegiance today by purchasing your guild apparel at mtgmerch.com. Uh, so on that back table in a match of uh, seven and two players, Shehar Shenhar won two games to one against Paul Rietzel. So uh, you know he goes he goes to eight and two. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Rietzel falls to a very very precarious seven and three. Yeah, that's where you you your your window for error has diminished significantly. Right. All right, so why don't we send it down for a little interview here with Jerry? Oh, great. 
Hi, I'm Tim Willoughby here with Jerry Thompson. <laughs> that quite the win there, Jerry. Tell me a little bit about Boros Rekna. Uh, it's good enough for me to play four in my constructed deck, so I figured I might as well play two in my limited deck, you know? <laughs> And how does that work? Did you open them both? No, after after pack one, I had three red denizens, which are like okay, um, but I wanted to draft like a really hyper aggressive deck. So I also had three ember beasts, and then I had a syndic of tithes. But I didn't pass like much green or white, so I figured I might end up in Grawl, might end up in Boros. But then pack two, I opened Reckoner. I'm just like okay, well I guess we're Boros, and then I got past another Reckoner immediately after. So I was like, all right, we're set. You got past that second Reckoner. Yeah. So. Are there many rares that you want to be seeing more than a Reckoner in a Boros deck? No, I don't think so. Like, Fire Main Avengers, very good, but the, the things that Reckoner does, like, if, if you guys watch that game, I mean, it's just insane. Like, he can't attack, he can't block, it burns him out, it's just insane, it does everything. And we were talking a little bit in the booth about the potential that you could have hung back with your Reckoner and Scorchwall could one of his attackers. Yeah, I, I was definitely thinking about like all the different things that were going on, but I don't think he's going to attack there. Like he's just going to try and kill me with that flyer. And uh, I thought like my time was kind of running out. Like I've drawn a lot of spells and there are a lot of lands left in my deck. So uh, I just thought that I had to kill him that turn. You know, I, I had an opening, so I took it basically. I don't know. Cool. I mean, the other red that we saw you play a little bit there was Five Alarm Fire. That one perhaps not one that people have played with quite so much. How's it been working out for you? Uh, it was good in that game one, but that is not a card that I played with either. And honestly, I would rather like not play with it, but uh, my deck ended up a little short. So it's in there. You know, I, I do have two Reckoners and I have like Act of Treason and stuff like that that are just like very, very aggressive and I wanted a way to finish them. So I figured that could be a card that would help me do a little something different. Fantastic. Thanks, Jerry. Now X and two? X and one. X and one, a great spot to be on the weekend. Keep it up and we'll see you fairly soon and we'll go back to the booth now. All right, so it looks like we're going to get a chance to take a look at Shuhei Nakamura versus Kenny Oberg here. And I believe we're on game three here. They're both, they're sitting at 1-1. One, one, one. Extra one time. We're moving over our camera so 11, we can get the overhead 12. shot for you. Yep. I'm 11 years old. And uh, we, we, have, uh, we have the player's hands here. So as soon as Great. we get the key up, we can take a look at what they're... And we see that... Uh, oops. Oh, that's an interesting Whoa, fact. that was kind of... That was kind of artistic. cool. Artistic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we see we have a fairly well-developed board here. Kenny's got a Syndic of Tithes, a Death Cult Rogue, and a huge bomb with an Angelic Skirmisher on his side of the table. Ten. But both of these guys are playing Orzov's splashing a little bit of Demir. Okay. Uh, for Shuhei, he's got a Basilicus creature with what looks like Hands yep. of Binding on it. Yes. Yeah, and he's also got a Syndicate Enforcer. Uh, and he's... Shuhei attacks with both creatures. That's going to be four damage. He's going to get a Nine. trigger from his yep. uh, hands of binding. That's going to keep the Seven. angelic skirmisher tapped down, 12. and he's going to get an extort trigger uh, out of it. Two five. extort triggers. Uh, two extort triggers. Such but the key to remember with skirmisher is that oh, its triggered nine. ability still happens yes, at the beginning of every combat. Yeah. He can give his creatures Yo. lifelink. He can give them vigilance. He can give them first yeah. strike, yeah. and it doesn't no, matter. Is that Herb's protector? I, I can't see on this No, no, one. it's a skirmisher. Okay. Yeah. So... So Kenny, if he if you he, if he's if Shuhei wants to race him, once we get the life totals up, life we'll have link. a better idea of, of exactly Eight. what the board state sits. But he, I think he just picked life link Eleven. and yep. says, "You take four, I gain four. We'll, we'll get those life totals up once we uh, once we have them for you." But right now, Go. if this game is a race and it looks kind of like a race, Kenny should be in the driver's seat. Let's see what Shuhei has. He's drawn a white mana source with an Orzov guild gate. He is again going to attack with both. He is going to cast his hands of binding, keep the angelic skirmisher tapped down. And he did, in fact, pay again both extort. So he is able to get in for four, five, six. So that's a lot of damage. Okay, yeah. And you can see the narrative of the game here is that Orzov guild gate that he just drew. He's been, he's been yep. choked for white mana. Oh, it's an Orzov Basilica, actually. Uh, choked for white mana. And uh, Dutiful Thrall, Dutiful Thrall, Daring Skyjack, Executioner Swing, Angelic Edict, all sitting in his hand. Wow. Okay, so he's got mostly black mana with blue as his splash, and he needed that white source. So it looks like he's using those extort triggers to keep himself alive. And he's also putting a lot of pressure as Kenny Oberg's. It looks like he's at five life here. 
Uh, Even can, gaining for a turn from that angelic skirmisher, it looks like Shuhei is able to, to race. Now, looking if, at Kenny's hand here, we see Gateway Shade and Death's Approach. Okay. Um, I see one non-creature in Shuhei's graveyard, so Death's Approach might just do nothing at this particular point in the game. Uh, this is interesting because, you know, if... Lifelink. Kenny Six. is going to keep attacking. He says, nine. give my guys lifelink. Attack with two of them. Shuhei's going to drop to six. Kenny's going to go to nine. Three. And the shade plus an extort trigger. And he can even cast the, uh, Ten, five, the death's seven, approach seven. if he wants. It won't do anything at the moment, but it can later. And he can get an extort trigger off of it if he feels like he needs yep. it to win the race. He, he'd rather keep his, uh, he's got three black mana sources and a gate, or two black mana sources and a gate. So he will have the ability to pump that shade one, two, three, four, right. power and toughness. And it looks like uh, a planes for Shuhei Nakamura. All right, so does Shuhei have a form of removal? No, Thrill, Thrill, Sky Jake. Oh, the Executioner Swing Seat. He does have an Edict, though. Yeah. And Angelic Edict card, is card we've been talking about a lot. Yeah, it's, it's just a, you need it. It's well, just it, a card you need in the format in, in to this, be able to well, get stuff deck, out of the it's way. It's spectacular, right? Yeah, like, sure. Yeah, just, it's just a little like, oh, is this what I want to do in Boros or not, right? Right. Which I guess you just want to do it. You do <laughs> because you need, like... You just want to clear the way. It, it really shows the difference between the two types of removal. One of them actively gets a creature out of the way which is what's going to happen right now, except for the Edict's actually going to take out Angelic Skirmisher and not the Shade here. So Shuhei knows he, Shuhei knows he can't win this turn, and uh, he's going to lose pretty quickly, so he needs to take that thing out. He can get in with the Screecher to tap down the Shade if he wants. He can also use the Syndicate Enforcer to block the Death Cult Rogue if he'd like. They're both right. rogues, I believe. So, but anyway, and he's also got an Executioner Swing, which is not proactive. He has to wait till he gets hit before he well. can play it. He uh, will be doing that. All right, so the Shade gets tapped down by Hands of Binding, and Shuhei's deciding if he wants to pay for Extort, but we know he doesn't really want to if he wants to use that Executioner Swing, that is. The life might be more relevant, though. It's not. He's going to play a Daring Skyjack most of the time. So Kenny untaps. He doesn't have the luxury of having that skirmisher anymore. And uh, Leyline Phantasm. Leyline Phantom, I think. Phantom. Yeah. A card we've actually been seeing a lot of this weekend. We really have. And uh, we've seen it used. We saw Svi Moshwitz yesterday use it very impressively. He resolved essentially three spells the entirety of a game and won it. And he resolved one. that one yeah. about five times. And four. He's going to play it out, and he's going to pay for the extort thanks to Syndic of Tides. Thanks. He is going to attack with both. So Shuhei does block on each one, and he's going to trade both and creatures now, off. Now, now, now the, he's turned on yep. the, ex <laughs> the Death's Approach. Death's Approach is now live. It's going to take down Basilica's creature, and yep. Kenny Ober is left with a 5-5 five, five, and a potentially huge gateway shade as well. Two, three, four, five. Two, three, Go. four, five. Yeah, so but, he, he can get. But two we know that those two tricks. dutiful thralls that have been oh, yeah. sitting in Shuhei's hand forever <laughs> are are able to keep those guys occupied. This is a great game. They they've basically equalized everything, and now it's going to come down to what Shuhei has in hand. He's got a uh, executioner swing in a swamp, I believe, and whatever Kenny just drew. Kenny just drew an executioner swing. Uh, I four. four. Okay, well, that's pretty good, because that will take down a dutiful thrall, which will mean one of his he, others is going to be able to get Very flattering for a dutiful thrall to get... Uh, I agree. To meet, to, ...to meet its end by the uh, by the axe. I agree. It's just one of the few ways you can actually kill a dutiful thrall. <laughs> All right. So Kenny's going to pump it once, and then we're going to see the executioner swing take down the thrall, because you do what you got to do sometimes. <laughs> that's going to open up the door for Kenny to get in for five damage a turn if Shuhei doesn't find something to uh, fix this situation. Uh, it looks like he just drew the timeliest of Grizzly Spectacles. Or was it a 1,000 Lashes? What was that? Uh, I think you're right, it's a Spectacle. He'll take either. <laughs> he, yeah. Yeah, he, I believe he's passing the turn. Three cards. Mm -hmm. Hey, look at Grizzly. Love the Art of Grizzly Spectacle. 
is the card that's in his hand, along with the executioner swing. Yep. Passes the turn back. Kenny untaps, draws his card for the turn. Ooh! Shuhei Nakamura's at four. And what that means is, is that he has lethal on the board as it sits, but he also has the ability to give one of his creatures flying with aerial maneuver if he felt like that would be relevant here. As it turns out, it, it would have been. Result. But he still has Result. a good situation here as Result. he says, pump, pump, pump. And that thing is going to meet a grisly, it's going to become a grisly spectacle as it dies. And Shuhei she, oh, remembers yeah, to yeah, regenerate, to regenerate his put prowl. that regeneration shield down. Okay. 1,000 lashes and a couple cards I couldn't quite see. And uh, this is going to go going back on. to his hand. Yeah. And he says, before it goes back to your hand, I am going to bring down the executioner swing as Kenny okay. stares at that aerial maneuver in his hand. And. Where are we? Uh -huh. So they're, what they're doing is figuring What's out at what point they are in combat or where the triggers uh, are at. Where are, um, this is after damage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's after the damage. He, ha he has to do it after damage or else he can't cast go. an executioner swing and he says go. So what can Shuhei find? Well, he's going to start <laughs> by attacking for one go. and he leads up. Uh, with cartel aristocrat. a cartel aristocrat. So he's got some level Another of power. Another card we've seen quite a bit of this weekend. Yep, Kenny has a psychic strike off the top, which is not going to do anything in this state as Kenny drops down to six. Go. And that's a corpse blockade, so that's not going to help the offensive for Shuhei. What can Kenny find to try to finish off this game? Is uh, that a 1,000 lashes? Sure or is it looks the, like a 1,000 lashes. It is a 1,000 lashes, look. and that's going to be instrumental here. The, the problem here is that uh, any of the creatures on Shuhei's side of the board can be sacrificed to either the Cartel Aristocrat yeah. or the Corpse Blockade. That's right, so it won't act as a win condition. And, and what did we learn yesterday from Sam Black? Sacrificing creatures is one of the most powerful mechanics in Magic. And one of the interesting things is, is that if Kenny, Kenny basically, if he puts it on the Cartel Aristocrat, then can't uh, Shuhei just sacrifice the blockade to give it protection from white or black and so it'll yes, come off? Yes, he can. But he chooses... Could, not could he not do that? I can't remember. Yeah, of course it'll fall off if it gains protection from a color. So why would Five. he? I would, I, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, let's move on here as this game is still underway. Kenny Oberg desperately trying to find some pressure. He finds his own dutiful throw. <laughs> we have a blocker fight here. Throw fight. <laughs> it's a throw down. And 1,000 lashes I mean, for <laughs> Shuhei Nakamura gets psychic striked. Wow, these guys are just throwing haymakers here, yet neither can finish each other off. What does Kenny draw for the turn? We know he has aerial yeah. maneuver still. I think he's drawn a land. I think it's a dual land. Undercity yep. Informer is going to be a 2-3 that is going to put a lot of pressure on Kenny here as it's going to allow Shuhei to start attacking. So what that means yep. is that he Kenny's going to have to have an answer eventually. Now, it is only going to be one damage a turn. This clock is, the game's a lot different with a, a cartel aristocrat. Okay, oh, I, I guess you, that can't, was you can't use the ability of the cartel aristocrat. Oh, you can use it in response, though. In response to the Thousand Lashes being played, you can yeah, just do it to have it like miss. To, to the misses. Yeah. yeah, to counter it. Go. All right, I thought that was a, a armored transport, but it's actually an Horus of Kiru. All right, Executioner's Swing is going to be used to take down the Undercity Informer, but is he's going to sacrifice it in response yep. so that he's going to grind him. He's going to make him mill cards until he hits a land. We're told that there's only one land in Kenny's graveyard already. He instantly finds the second one there. So that win condition is gone. And Kenny is still relatively stable at four life. He's facing down two power now, one of which he can block indefinitely. But what is he tapping for here? A Zerichi Tiger. 
So now he has the ability to attack if he wants, but it doesn't do anything because there's too many blockers for Shuhei, so it's going to start gaining him two life a turn, and this game is still live. Shuhei has no re reliable form of pressure right now. He can get in there and gain a life, which is what he's going to do yeah, with his spores off key rune. <laughs> But nobody's dying anytime soon, even though they're both in a very precarious four life. Block, regenerate. Gain a life. <laughs> Go. And a Basilica Screecher for Shuhei is going to add some amount of pressure here, although it won't be able to race the life gain from the Zarichi Tiger and, and, still. And keep in mind, we know that there's still an aerial maneuver in there, which that is, is going to ambush that Tiger. Oh, and it looks like we just saw a fascinating card. Was that a stolen identity? That was a stolen identity. Oh, wow. Th this could be the game ender here, depending on how things go with Shuhei's draw step. Let's see what happens here from Kenny. He's got a lot of options. You see him hesitate. He's tapped the mana for stolen identity, but he has not yet cast it. He wants to make sure that he gets this sequence perfect before he does. So he wants the stolen identity copy. Uh, Basilica Screecher? He could do that. He could also then, just copy the and then tiger. Cipher onto the Screecher. Copy. Yes. Copy this. Uh huh. And oh, he counters it by it, sacrificing it to Corpse. It Lucky. does target, right? This is yeah. not a normal clone where it Go. enters the battlefield as a copy. It actually targets. So Shuhei says, no, sir. That's not how this is going to work as he sacrifices it to the Corpse. What he Lucky. could have done is copy the Orzov. Well, well Kenny needed to, set, needed to copy his Tiger. Yeah. Because Shuhei would have to have instant speed removal to interrupt that, and that's not the worst case scenario. But he got a little ambitious and went for one of Shuhei's creatures. You saw Shuhei read the card, and he's like, yeah, I'm not letting that happen, man. Like, it does kill the Screecher, you know, which right. is relevant to the game. So, you know, if Kenny's goal is just, I need to kill that Screecher, and that's all that matters, he can do that. I don't think that's the case because the, the Tiger will gain enough life so that the Screecher shouldn't be able to beat him. But, so I think I would have just gone for that, especially if you have three tigers, two tigers, you know. Yeah, yeah. Even if they can't get through, just two tigers getting four life a turn means that uh, Kenny can can beat a bat no problem. Right. Not not sure who's ahead on cards, but you're you're, you're committing yourself pretty much at that point. Too. That's right. So it's not like Kenny got no value out of that card. He used it as a four blue blue removal spell, but uh, you think he probably could have got a little Six. more. All right, another one damage comes in. Uh, it's going to get blocked, of course, but it is going to gain Shuhei a life. It's going to put him up to six. Or five. Maybe he gained one from before. All right, so he's going to play out. Midnight recovery. Oh, interesting. A midnight mm -hmm. recovery here. Hey, if they're going to grind each other out, this is one that can certainly do it. He's going to get back. He's looking at Basilica Screecher, but he looks like he's changing his mind here. And we see him doing some math. He gets, actually gets Undercity Informer. Oh, interesting. And he is going to put it on his Dutiful Thrill, which presumably won't be able to six, get in for six, damage any time too soon. Because he, he's realizing with that Tiger that he might just need. If this game goes that long, then the, the Undercity Informer could be a win condition, although you'd really like to see him combo off with Midnight Recovery and Undercity Informer, just sure. sacking guys and recurring that. But it didn't look like he wanted to go for the Screecher there. Yeah, the problem is he's not going to be able to get his dutiful thrall through. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. But he could also just get the Screecher back. That puts it in his hand. Yeah, it's, it's not going to work. So he, he didn't really have a choice other than to... Uh, to just put it on yeah. one of the dudes he had on the battlefield anyway, so he might as well get his best creature back, which apparently was the Undercity Informer. All right, he says, I'm going to attack my, uh, activate my key rune, attack for with the 1-4 lifelink. The, the slow, steady climb uphill. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's been padding. Four. He's going to go to seven now. Yep, padding his life total. This is super important, especially that we know that Kenny Oberg has aerial maneuver in his hand which which could threaten four damage at any time yeah. from a from a creature but now you know Shuhei's gonna be up higher and higher. <clears throat> Alright, Shuhei passes the turn after the block. Kenny Oberg is gonna activate his Zurichi Tiger. He's gonna gain two more life and draw a card, I believe it's land. Hey. Go. Alright, 
and so Shuhei Nakamura hits his draw step. He's got two lands in hand. He is going to activate the key rune and attack. We're starting to get used to this. Beautiful throw gets in the way. He gets regenerated, and Shuhei gains a life yep. out of the deal. Passes the turn back. Uh, I think that Kenny just forgot his Rechi Tiger there. Yeah, I don't think he gained the two life, so a little oversight from Kenny there, although it's starting to look like his life total is becoming less and less important oh. as we get a quick count of... Yeah, there's about 10 cards left in his library. Okay. There's two, two lands, lands in the graveyard, three lands, four lands in hand. And there's eight on the battlefield. So that's... That's uh, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So he's getting there. 10. Sure. He could, like, he doesn't know about the lands in hand. Sure, of course not. So that's and you, and the. You the don't want to give thing. that information away. That's right. Ooh, a Dusk Mantle Guild Mage for Kenny Oberg. I hear some reaction from a crowd potentially here, as that's the type of card that can turn the mill race right back in Kenny's favor. This game is fascinating. I'm really curious to see. Because now Kenny wants to start dumping all of his lands on the table, but that's going to give Shuhei a lot of information about when to move in on sacking his whole team to try to mill out Kenny. So let's see the dust milling match. There's about five minutes on the clock. We're told Shuhei is also at nine, and that dust mantle yep. guild mage can get in for a lot of damage as well with the milling if you have enough. Uh, it's basically two damage a turn. Okay, it looks like Shuhei's going for it. He sacrificed a creature, and here comes the grind. Spell, 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 land. All right, so he got a full four off that. There's only three left. Shuhei's going to be able to do the math, and I think he realizes... Is he alpha striking? He is, he is <laughs> alpha striking here. Is this beta striking? <laughs> and Kenny extends yeah. the <laughs> hand as Shuhei finds a way to take down that game. It eventually... Ended up being Undercity Informer that did it as Shuhei wins 2-1 to one over Kenny Oberg. <laughs> wow, that was a great game. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. This is Brian David Marshall. And we just saw someone alpha strike the deck. Yeah, I think I'm going to call that beta strike from okay. now on. Okay. <laughs> That was incredible. We had, you know, we came in and they were jockeying for position. The dust fully settled with a couple of dutiful throws staring each other down. And then it got crazy. Yeah, no, and, they, you know, they, they were exchanging blows. They were both very low on life. They both had uh, extort creatures going around and they were, they were like nibbling at each other's life totals and everything cleared away. And then it ended up coming down in the end. You know, we saw them both shift shift gears you know kenny's like well i'm just gonna gain enough life try to get to my cards that let me you know deck my opponent right and uh you know under city informer came back from mm -hmm. beyond you know with a midnight recovery for shui nakamura and he was able to just you know just sacrifice essentially sacrifice all his creatures right and you know you know get kenny down to uh no cards. that's right and you know kenny was digging and digging and just hoping to hit this card and he actually finally did he hit his dusk mantle guild mage it was a couple of turns too late because a few activations of that would have not only put shuhei in a position where his life total would have been threatened but also his deck right. and, and you know at the end of the game kenny's like oh i had these lands in my hand but you you're in that kind of game mm -hmm. you have to know that the four cards in his hand yeah. are lands. That's right. Because otherwise he'd be playing them. That's right. Yeah. All right, so it looks like we're ready to go back to the news desk. After that, we'll be back for the final round of drafts. See you guys in a few minutes. All right, thanks to Marshall and Brian David Marshall. We have one more round of draft to come. But first, we have a draft viewer extravaganza for one of the greatest limited minds in the history of the game. Never mind just now. I promised you Ben Stark, and Ben Stark is what you're going to get over at the video wall with Zach Hill round about now. Okay, welcome back. Uh, just a slight technical difficulty there. We'll bring you the sound because we do want to hear what Ben Stark has to say. Let me give you uh, some matches that we've got in. Now, Paul Reaney, he was 7-0 and uh, coming in. Uh, he's now down to 7-3, and so he's lost his first two rounds in the top pod. 
Timothy Simono, meanwhile, we saw him lose on camera to Melissa Datura in the first round. He's now 8 1 and 1. Uh, Bacera, 7 and 3 at the expense. Isaac Egan from Australia took the win there, 8 and 2. Also 8 and 2 is Eric Froelich, and that's because, Zach, as you know full well, Ben Stark won that match of friends, exactly. rivals, teammates. Yeah. Um, so uh, Ben Stark, 9 and 1, Eric Froelich, 8 and 2. Also 9 and 1 is Mr. Jerry Thompson of the United States. Uh, he put paid to Robert Jurkovic, you saw there, 7, 2 and 1. And our Ital uh, Italian top player, Spanu, he is now up to 8 and 2. Joel Larsson uh, of Sweden now has uh, his third loss. So Larsson down to 7 and 3. Someone hanging on at 7 and 3 uh, is Gerlock from the United States. That is at the expense of Matteo Orsini-Jones. So British fans, uh, he came in, I think it was 6-2 overnight. He obviously didn't have a great draft, now 6-3 and then 6-4. And finally, in the top tables, uh, I've got Bolick at 8-2. Loic Lebron uh, of France, Lebriand rather, 6-3 and 1. Uh, so we'll see what's happening uh, with audio uh, on our Ben Stark feature. Um, but give us a little teaser, Zach. First question, where did Ben go? What does he actually end up drafting in terms of an archetype? For sure. So he's actually in an Orzhov deck. Uh, Orzhov deck. He, he was very excited about it. And something that he mentioned was actually that he believes Orzhov is a very aggressive guild. A lot of people view it as a control deck. In fact, when I was walking out with him, he, John Finkel approached and said, so, you know, the format has one control deck, Orzhov, right? And Ben started arguing with him. So uh, definitely sort of took it in a little bit of a different direction from what we're used to seeing. A really interesting draft. All right, well, we'll see how that goes. Let's see if we can take a look at our master scoreboard uh, from coming in overnight. Melissa Datora, remember, came in at 8-0. She then went to 9-0 but she has had her first loss, now nine and one. So there you see her at the top left of your screen. Still a co-leader of four. Timothy Simono of France, great story. The group um, testing together, Jeremy Dazani, Louis Del Tour uh, in amongst those, eight, one and one. Paul Rini, as we say, has not had a great start to the day. He's down at seven and three, as is Felipe Tapia Becerra, seven and three. Eric Froelich, eight, two. Ben Stark up to nine and one, and also, and this sets up the final round of draft beautifully, Ben Stark will face Don van Ravenswey of the Netherlands at nine and one. So, what will Ben Stark go into action with? Let's go over to the video wall once again. We'll even call it the video with sound wall. Here comes Ben Stark. Hi, welcome to the Tournament Center. I'm Zach Hill, and we're here with Pro Tour champion and limited expert Ben Stark. Ben, you're sitting at nine and one right now. Uh, you've got to be feeling pretty decent about yeah, this. Yeah, so I'm feeling pretty decent. Still a long way to go, but uh, I'm certainly happy with how the first ten rounds went. Cool. <laughs> so we're going to go through uh, the first uh, five picks of your first three packs of this draft and just get a look into how exactly you constructed your deck. Sure. So if we can go ahead and take a look at that first pack. Now, you open your pack. You see these cards right here. Did, did any of these cards stand out to you as stuff that you yeah. want to go into? There's only a couple of cards I would even consider here, and I did consider. Um, Grizzly Spectacle, I believe, is the best common in the set. Okay. Uh, Mugging, top five yeah. common in the set, and uh, you know, real nice. And, For sure. And Arrows, which I believe is worse than Mugging in Grizzly Justice, but still a nice removal spell, and has the added advantage of being red or white. Right, So exactly. that you can play it in four of the five guilds. So, I mean, that's, you know, a pretty big game. For sure. Or three so, of the five, rather, not blue, green, or blue, black, but, <laughs> but still. Right, so you ended up going with the spectacle, right? Yeah. Is this a case of just like the flexibility being less important than just the overall power level of the card, or do you prefer any of the specific guilds? Well, really, I mean, what you're, Grizzly Spectacle is better than Mugging, I think, uh -huh. so I'm going to take Spectacle over Mugging, and uh, it just comes down to Arrows and Spectacle then, and you know, Arrows hasn't really impressed me. It's, uh, it's such a fast format. A lot of times you're, when you're on the play, you need to be removing their blocker before oh, yeah. they can attack. And these days, this has been true for many sets, a lot of the bombers are creatures, and you need to be able right. to remove them, and like Arrows doesn't remove a lot of cards, you know, Biomancer and the draw card, you know, a lot of these exactly. guys aren't attacking. So, yeah, for sure. So really, Guild mages yeah, too. So really any chance I get in this day and age to first pick something like a Grizzly Spectacle, like a, a murder-esque type card, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm always pretty happy with it. Awesome. All right, so let's take a look at the, uh, the next pack now. So you, you first pick Grizzly Spectacle. 
uh, you see in this pack, like kind of a, a lot of not blanks, but uh, I mean, Killing Glare, very similar to Grizzly Spectacles. Right. Is this a pretty straightforward this pick? This is a for pretty you? straightforward pick. I mean, if this was pack one, it would be a tough pick because I mean, I don't consider Killing Glare nearly as good as Grizzly Spectacle, which oh, yeah? costs a lot of mana to kill things, for and sure. this is a very fast format. Obviously, having first picked the black removal and all these cards being right. pretty close, I'm going to second pick Killing Glare here, no decision. But you could, if this was pack one, for example, pick uh -huh. one, you would definitely be considering the Swine, the Jeez, Flux Mage, and the Killing Glare. All oh, okay. three of them are excellent cards. The Flux really? Mage is beautiful for Simic. It, it grows, it makes it impossible to block, and you want to keep attacking. Sure. Very powerful card. Zartar Swine also is a perfect rule card. I, in Gruul, I generally try and play low land counts so that I can then cast my five drops if I drew right. a few too many land or just blood rush them if I don't. Right, exactly. So I like to play like 15, 16 lands. Oh, and, cool. a, and a card like Swine is just absolutely what I'm looking for. That's really awesome to know, too, because I wouldn't have intuited in a deck with a bunch of five mana cards to play fewer well, lands. It's a, but it makes it's sense. a three mana card as much as it's a five mana card. And totally. that's, that's why it allows you to do that. So you basically never really get flooded or screwed. If you play a bunch of one, two, and three mana creatures, for and sure. then all your cards that cost, say, four or more have blood rush, you can get away with. With 15 to 16 lands and you're never really flooded or screwed and you're always on the offensive which is what you want if you're girl yeah that's awesome all right so what, what ended up happening you did pick the glare you've got two black removal spells coming into this pack you look here you, you do see a lot of black you've got gateway shade gutter skull which is not awesome but you'll frequently play right. a guild gate to fix your mana and then of course the the guild mage in the pack Again, is there anything else you're looking at, or is this kind no, of exactly where you want to be? This is a pretty easy pick, too, because right now, if there was another black card that was equal to the Gil Mage, I'd uh -huh. be inclined to take it so I could still play still Demir play or Demir Orzhov, but there isn't. The black cards in this pack, I mean, sure, yeah. if I table the Gutter Skull or the Gateway Shade, it may make my main, but sure. those really aren't good cards, you know? Right. Whereas the Black White Gil Mage is a nice card, and Assault Griffin's a nice card, but if I play Assault Griffin, I'm going to be You'll Black be White. Black anyway. So I, the Gil Mage is a better totally. card. Totally. Yeah. All right, so let's take a look at the fourth pick. Uh, you, you kind of a step down for me, I think. Uh, and nothing really Definitely. exciting this pack to begin with. And you, you got Court Street, Denizen. What did you think at this point? Exactly what you said. Definitely a oh, step yeah. down. I mean, I'm, at this point, if I'm going to be Orzov, I'm hoping for some of the good Orzov commons. You're talking about Smite. Kingpin's pet, oh, yeah? uh, Basilica's creature. You know, I'm not expecting a Grizzly Spectacle fifth, but you know For that sure. one. You know, uh, so Syndicate of Tides. You know, got you. Court Street Denison. When you're on the draw, it's terrible. You're on the draw roughly half the time. Right. <laughs> when you're on the play, it's okay, but it's still right. not even that impressive. So, I mean, you know, it's a fine playable, but I, I wasn't happy about fourth pick. Sure. All right, so not happy with this. Let's look at the fifth pack. Uh, Guild Gate again. I mean, it's kind of the only card in the pack right yeah. here. Uh, not, not super interesting, but hey, it fixes your mana. Even less so. happy about this one. I mean, oh, yeah. Gates are fine in some decks, but I'm, in, I'm not trying to play three colors. Black-white is pretty deep. I'm not expecting enough to splash. The mana is not that intensive in black-white. You don't really have black-black two drops or white-white two sure. drops or anything. I don't even really love Gates. Like, I'll play 8-8-1. Eight, eight, sometimes I, it blows you out. You need yeah. the mana. If I have two or three Gates and I'm not splashing or anything, I won't even play them all in black-white. Sure. I'll usually just play one so I can play 8-8-1 eight, eight, and have nine sources. Cool. Anyway, at the end of the, these first fed packs, despite not being too happy. You're firmly submitted in Orzov, so let's yeah. go a little bit more quickly through the pack. Yeah, no, now not that, that unhappy. I mean, to start with a Grizzly Spectacle into a Killing sure. Glare is a nice draft. But yeah, picks exactly. four and five just kind of disappointed me. I was hoping for a little more, you know? Cool. So we're back to the black cards. You're looking at a Cartel Aristocrat right now, firmly in Orzov. Crypt Ghast, actually not a card that I've played with a lot. It's what you picked out of this pack. Uh, is it a bomb rare or is it I mean, it I'm not going to call it a bomb rare, Sure, but it's an easy pick. It's a first oh, yeah. pick quality card, you know? It's not a bomber in the sense like windmill slam it, don't look at the pack, you know? <laughs> but it's, right. you know, on par with those good commons. Like, depending on your deck, it would be a close pick with like, you know, a Smite or a, a Kingpin's Pet, you know, the best cool. commons. So, I mean, it's definitely better than a Cartel Aristocrat, which is also a fine card. Right. But it's not, Cartel Aristocrat is not on par with those with, kind of cards, with, with direct removal or... Cool. All right, so let's, let's look at the next pack. I, uh, I'm seeing a Daring Skyjack. A lot of people don't really like it in Orzhov. Really not a whole lot else. Uh, you don't want to be playing an off-color so horror. So it's great you that. say that, because I should yeah. actually elaborate on that a little yeah, bit. please do. People have been drafting Orzhov completely wrong, in my really? opinion. And yeah. why is that? It's not a control deck. Like, <laughs> so... Extort lends itself to cheap cards so that you can extort them. It doesn't lend itself to five and six drops. Right, because right? then you're not being then able to extort. Extorting. Extorting. And your extort totally. cards are not that great, two mana, two, two, three mana, two, two, but they are great cards if you're extorting all the time. Right, right. So, and it's hard to race somebody if they're gaining life and making you lose life. Right. Smite, same thing, nice, cheap if you're racing, not the best with five and six drops. If I right. have a smite in my hand and I'm going to play a five or a six drop, why when are you going to cast smite? smite? Right. Yeah. And I don't need to smite anything. My five and six drops bigger anyway. This figure lends itself well to five and six drops. Smite sure. lends itself well to little creatures, as does Extort. So the way you're supposed to draft uh, Orzhov, it's not so much that you call it beatdown, you call it control, it's you want all the cheap cards. Yeah. I like a Daring Skyjack. 
I can play it on turn three or four, get an extorter two out of it, and then attack with it as a flyer. Or I can play it on turn two if I'm on the draw or something and trade with any of Boros's right. two drops or Simic's two drops if I can. Or and in whatever. an aggressive deck, you can get the last few points of damage with Extort as opposed to having to just kill them right. so on your Extort. I'm not happy about second picking during Skyjack because sure. second pick you're always hoping for Grizzly Spectacle or a Bomber or you know, whatever. But I like Derek Skyjack and Orzov. I have no awesome. problem with that. So Orzov, an aggressive deck. All right, let's get through some yeah. of the rest of these picks. Let's take a look at this. Kingpin's Pet, I feel like it's one of the premier Orzhov cards. Yeah. Not really a lot of decision yeah. here. I, I, there's nothing else really in this pack. No decision. Right. Premier Orzhov card outside of Grizzly Spectacle with second best common for Orzhov. Awesome. Yeah, just an easy pick. Everything you want. Night Vale Spectre is a fantastic card, but the black, black, black just casting. Too calls. hard to cast. I'll play it in my Orzov decks with nine sources, but I'm certainly not going to take it over Kingpin's Pet to play it with off nine sources. Makes sense. You know? All right, so we've got the Kingpin's Pet. What's next? All right, well, now you have got to be thrilled to get thrilled. a thousand lashes yes, this yes. one. So, a second pick, Staring Skyjack, a little disappointed. Third pick, Kingpin's Pet, about on par, pretty yeah. happy, you know? Yeah. Fourth pick, Jumping for Joy. One thousand <laughs> lashes could not be better. This is a yeah. really aggro racing grinding life total kind of a format, and this is just beautiful. I mean, kill any creature, bomb rare doesn't get to activate its abilities, big, small, doesn't yep. matter, and then drain them for five as you're sitting there, extending the game with extort and totally. making it go longer. I mean, I, it seems like exactly what you want. Yeah, right? th th I mean, this in this deck is practically a bomb rare. I mean, it's just a windmill slam first pick. You, like, awesome. you love any 1,000 lashes you can get. And you got it fourth. All right, yeah, fifth, super pack excited and, about that. fifth pick in pack two, Syndic of Ties. I mean, it's like one of the best mono white commons. Sick in this yeah. deck. Even sicker if you're playing aggressive. Let, let's let's go to the third pack though and see sort of a full pack's worth of choices. Now, you, you, I've seen like if you're in an aggressive deck, a lot of people like a card like Righteous Charge. It's kind of tempting, yeah. um, but it's sort of high variance. Guarding the Gateless, I've heard people say, "Oh, it's five mana. I don't want to be playing it in this format." Yeah. Is it's just so good that it doesn't matter? No, uh, Guardian of the Gateless is way overrated. Oh yeah, um, it's a nice card. Some, it's, sometimes it stops the beatdown, but it doesn't For attack sure. all that well. There's plenty of spot removal. I mean, it's not, I mean, I'll pretty much always play it, but oh, I won't yeah. take it over very many of the good Orzhov Cobb cards. Like I said, I consider the five basic uh, Orzhov commons, Syndic of Tides, Basilisk Creature, Smite, Grizzly Spectacle, and Kingpin's Pack. For sure. I would never and take Guardian of the Gateless over any of the over five. Any of those. Yeah, I cannot right. imagine having a normal Orzhov deck and ever taking it. Really? Okay, so let's round out this pack really quick. I did Pick take it. Uh, sorry, I did take yeah, it there yeah. because there was that or the plus two plus two card, which I don't think is Just very good. not good enough. Yeah. All right, Fire Main Adventure, off color. It, you know, it's but it's it's one of the best cards in the pack. I'm not big on hate drafting. It's one of the best rares in the set. There, I would gladly have took Kingpin's Pet or Smite over it, but as you can see, I would have been taking a dutiful throw all over yeah. it. So I said, just in case I peel two Boros lands this pack or a Prism and a Boros land or something, For then sure. maybe I'll splash the Avenger. But not actively looking to splash. Not actively really. looking to splash. Willing to splash it if I happen to pick up those cards, not over the good commons or anything For like sure. that. You know? All right, pick three. We're looking at, I mean, yet another Syndic of Tithes. Exactly what you want. Let's take a look at pick four. Uh, Herbus Protector, sort of six mana. Do you think you're going to play this card? Not in love with Herbus Protector. I did have a Court Denison or two, so I said, you know, maybe this guy sure. will make my deck. I'm Tap like, two guys yeah. with it. But I, I'm not happy about it. I'm not looking to play it. Hate all, right. all the expensive spells in Orzov. Amen. Uh, just rounding this out very quickly. Syndicate Enforcer, kind of average, not awesome. Yeah. And finally, what we have. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Well, it uh, looks like you put together a pretty awesome deck despite that. You're 2 0 in the pod right now. I am 2 0 right? in the pod. Uh, it is a good deck. It has a good curve. It's got removal. It's certainly nothing special. I hope to keep drawing well. Awesome. Well, good luck today, Ben. This is Ben Stark, Pro Tour Champion. I'm Zach Hill. This is the Tournament Center. Welcome back to the news desk. Worth the wait because Ben Stark really is one of the best minds in the game. He talks common sense and smart people listen. Smart people include Zach, the rest of Team Channel Fireball. That's exactly right. I mean, that's his role on the team, is to come in, figure out the limited format, let everyone else break constructed, and uh, together they win the turn. You know when you sit, maybe you don't know, but you know when you sit with someone who's better than you and you just listen to them talk to their opponent and you know their friends and you're kind of just an acquaintance, you're at your local store and it's the guy who always four and O's Friday Night Magic and you just get to sit behind them and watch them play and when they're talking out loud and it suddenly starts to all make sense, for me, very few things in Magic are more exciting than when you get to do that behind oh, Ben Stark. Yeah. You know, you'll watch him team draft with a bunch of fireball guys, and he's just sitting there going, yeah, that's the third best black common. Generally, that's a signal that they're going to go this way. And then, you know, that's going to show that this is open, and this is clearly where you want to be. You don't want to take that. It looks really good. It's very disappointing. You never have the third creature. 
He's a machine oh, yeah. for his analysis. Of course, and like some people you never know what they're thinking. He is not one of those people. <laughs> Him and like Matthias Hunt, it's like, okay, you know, stream of consciousness, you know exactly where their mind's going. And it's a great person to have on your team because you don't have to decipher all of the hidden meaning or the kind of subtle, you know, chemistry of what their behavior is. He's gonna tell you exactly what's good and how good it is and why he thinks so. Uh, and also, in another mental sport, you know how a lot of chess players will sort uh, of do uh, special exhibitions where they will play against multiple right, opponents? Like a simul? Yeah. yeah. You can see Ben start walking around a room of laptops, picking cards from people sometimes <laughs> in Magic Online. It's like, oh yeah, it's that, not close. And then, oh, I don't know, you could go either way. And it's that's that's fun as well. Uh, so congratulations uh, to Ben Stark. He's a nine and one, one of four co-leaders here at Pro Tour Gatecrash with one round of limited still to go. Zach, you've got the standings now. Who have we got leading the way at nine and one as we head in to round 11? Well, we've got Melissa DeTora leading the pack, nine, uh, nine wins with the opponent's match win percentage of 72%, which is kind of incredible mm -hmm. uh, when you think about it, although that's what happens when you start out undefeated. Great deck, really well positioned coming into it. We've got uh, Don Van Ravensvai also at 27 points, mm -hmm. Ben Stark like we talked about, and finally my pick when you asked about it earlier, Jerry Thompson really showing up at the Pro Tour. Okay, so then two points further back, you see Timothy Simono from France, eight, one, and one. And it's one of those things, have you lost two points when you draw? Have you gained a point when you draw? On day one, it always feels like you've lost two points because right. you must get to that four and four mark and it's another round gone by without right. three points. But on day two, it kind of feels the other way around, that you are one point ahead, you see him there, ahead of all the right. eight and twos, well ahead of all the seven and threes. He's a round and a half ahead of them, if you will. So keep an eye on Simono. Rest of our top eight, Zach, currently? Uh, we've got Eric Froelich, fan favorite, mm -hmm. really uh, experienced player, sitting at 24 points. Uh, Gianluca Spagnu of Italy, also at 24. Robbie Bullock of the USA in a breakout tournament for him. All right, uh, and then we get into the sort of realm of the people sort of bubbling under. Right. Remember, right now, the fourth loss we think is very, very critical. And just to give you a guide, when you look at people on seven and three, you've, that begins with Paul Rini from uh, Chinese Taipei. He's in 19th place, but that stretches all the way down to Matthew Pratzer of the United States. He is in 57th. So all of those are gonna collide over the next couple of hours and knock each other out of the tournament. Right. That's the way that works. The fourth loss, very bad news. Not absolutely the end of the road. If Melissa de Tora, for example, ended up at 12 and four, she'd probably still have fantastic exactly. tie breaks, might be an eighth. But generally the fourth loss, bad news. So what about some of the players, Zach, sitting there at eight and two right now? We've got Shahar Shenha. Right. He's currently at top of the eight and twos, purely on the, in, in amongst the right. not quite in the top eight yet. Isaac Egan, who's been bubbling around the top of the standings throughout. But in 14th and 16th place, two people we're very concerned about, Makahisa Mahara Japan, Tom Martel from the United States. Let's see who comes out of draft with the best results. Melissa Datura coming your way, of course, against Isaac Egan, Makahisa Mahara Martel. But first, Don Van Ravenswey against Ben Stark. It's time for the final limited round of Pro Tour Gatecrash 2013.